This is so cool. Okay, can I can I get over to where I was? I can. Let's go see a large boat. It is just truly so wild to me that anything that big can float. This is so cool. This is great. Hi, people working the deck. Thank you for all that you do. Okay, so we just watched a freighter go by. We are currently on an island in the middle of the Detroit River. And check that out, right behind us. A lighthouse. I love functional buildings. Hey there. So I don't get downstate very often, but this month I had a free day in Detroit and ended up kicking around a place I'd never been before, Belle Isle. As I walked around, I came across so many beautiful things, but also two stories that are united by a bunch of ancient dead sea creatures. The first is about a statue Detroiters a hundred years ago really did not want you to notice, and the second is about why people paid a lot of money to build a lighthouse out of marble. It's story time! First, I'll set you up with some context. Belle Isle is a park in Detroit, Michigan, located in the Detroit River. So here's a fun thing. If you look across the river there, you get the gorgeous city of Detroit. There's downtown. And if you follow that bridge across the river, you end up in Windsor, Canada. Thank you, Photogenic Seagull. So that's fun. When the Anishinaabe inhabited this land, they called it a Swan Island. When the French settled here in the 1700s, they kept animals here and nicknamed it Hog Island. Slightly less majestic. The name Belle Isle didn't show up until the 1840s, by which point the island had already been bought from the Anishinaabe, although it is unclear how accurate of a word bought really is. In any case, by the 1840s, the island had already changed hands several more times, and eventually the city of Detroit bought Belle Isle in 1879. Today, Belle Isle is just under a thousand acres, making it larger than Central Park in New York City. And speaking of Central Park... Oh man, small world here. So the sign is just teaching me about the, the history of all these beautiful canals. And it, it says that the uh, city of Detroit bought Belle Isle in 1879 and wanted to turn this area into a park. Good job, they did that. Uh, they said that Frederick Law Olmsted, so the, the landscape architect best known for designing Central Park in New York City, Frederick Law Olmsted was hired to develop a plan for this island, which Small world, because I am 95% positive that Frederick Law Olmsted was also consulted on Presque Isle Park up in Marquette, where Black Rocks is. So, this guy did some good business. Good job, man. In Detroit, a lot of Frederick Law Olmsted's work on Belle Isle has been built over, but the three-zone design he set up is still really apparent. There's a formal zone, an active zone, and a natural zone. And that brings us to our first of two stories over in the formal zone. Before I really jump in, I will say that there is so much to learn and explore on Belle Isle, and this video is barely even scratching the surface. These two stories happen to be from around the early 1900s, when Detroit was a very different city. I would love to spend more time learning about the more recent history in Detroit. So if you happen to know any Detroiters who are making videos about the city, or just like, have book recommendations, please feel free to let me know in the comments. All right, that said, on with the first story. So whenever I see people take pictures or videos at Belle Isle, I always see them stop by this fountain, which I think you can very maybe make out in the background. But anyway, I'm curious what the story behind that thing is. It's April right now and it looks like the fountain's not on, but let's go check it out. Also, another moment of tree appreciation because, oh my gosh, these are just so beautiful. Alrighty, already, already. Hello, fountain. Oh, wow. This is really ornate. Oh my gosh. This is the James Scott Memorial Fountain. As a piece of architecture, it's beautiful. There are all sorts of creatures, and these reliefs depict an interpretation of early life in the Detroit area. In a wild turn of events, I also learned that the designer of this fountain was Cass Gilbert, who, among other things, also designed the Detroit Public Library and the U.S. Supreme Court building. But this isn't a story about Cass Gilbert. It's a story about this guy. I almost didn't notice this statue, and honestly, that was kind of the point. This is James Scott, and people, well, they did not like him. James Scott was said to be lazy, vulgar, vindictive, a womanizer, and just generally not a great dude. He inherited a fortune from his dad and spent his days investing in real estate, but also gambling, drinking, and just 
being a nuisance. One of his hobbies seemed to be filing lawsuits against his business competitors. So, what's up with the statue? Unfortunately, this is not one of those, oh, he redeemed himself later in life and became an upstanding member of society kind of stories. When James Scott died in 1910, he gave his fortune to the city of Detroit and told them they could build a public landmark with it. Except, here was the catch. He also told the city they had to build a life-size statue of him, which prompted a lot of debate. According to the Detroit News, one local pastor proposed that the statue should be about two and a half inches tall to represent Scott's moral standing. Another person said, and I quote, Mr. Scott never did anything for Detroit in his lifetime, and he never had a thought that was good for the city. But this was a complicated decision. I mean, do you give the people of Detroit a beautiful landmark in exchange for a giant statue of a good-for-nothing socialite? Or do you just let James Scott's name die, even if it means the money isn't used? The final decision was to go with the first option, but only begrudgingly. So the fountain was built and it was unveiled in 1925. And the city took their statue of James Scott and tucked it away in what they hoped was an inconspicuous corner. I even saw one account say that they placed the statue where the water from the fountain blows heaviest in hopes that the statue would eventually weather away. After about a hundred years though, no luck so far. Although I will say I did spend a solid 15 minutes at the fountain without realizing there was a statue there. So there's that. Now, I love understanding the stories behind things and how they got to be the way they are. So learning this story really scratched an itch in my brain. That said, here's the first thing I really noticed about this fountain. I do kind of wish it were on, okay. So I think these steps are marble. That's, I wonder if they're real marble? That's a thing I could probably find out. Can confirm, it's made of marble, specifically marble from Vermont. But since there aren't like huge marble quarries where I live in the Upper Peninsula, I realized I didn't know much of anything about this stone or where it comes from or what story it tells. I certainly did not know that marble is, in large part, made of transformed dead sea creatures. Cue the animations. More than 500 million years ago, in what's now the eastern U.S., there was once an ocean called the Iapetus Ocean. And this ocean was full of all sorts of wonderful and familiar and unfamiliar creatures who eventually died. Over the years, their remains settled at the bottom of the water, along with various sediments. And as the years came and went, those bits and pieces were buried and compressed. First a little, then a whole lot until eventually the remains were pressed together so tightly they became stone. This is limestone, and you can often find fossils in it, but that's not where this story stops. Millions of years later, when this tectonic plate collided with another tectonic plate, that limestone was subjected to incredible heat and pressure, and the grains in the limestone recrystallized, creating marble. Marble that eventually made its way up to the surface for humans to find and turn into fancy fountains and also a lighthouse in Detroit. And that brings us to story number two. After poking around the middle section of Belle Isle, where the aquarium and the conservatory were both closed, as was the meme-worthy giant slide, I headed over to the northeast side of the island, or what Frederick Law Olmsted would call the natural zone. Because I heard they had a lighthouse, and I am quietly on a quest to visit all of the lighthouses in Michigan. The one on Belle Isle is called the William Livingstone Memorial Lighthouse. It's the only lighthouse in the country that's made of marble, and I had some questions. And now I'm walking over to see a lighthouse, and if this is the lighthouse, it is unlike any lighthouse I've ever seen before, and I'm willing to bet it has a really fascinating story. Okay, let's go see. Something I feel very curious about with this lighthouse is that to my knowledge, marble, I, I haven't heard of marble like forming geologically in Michigan. I'd be happy to be wrong about that, but which tells me that somebody went through a lot of time and effort and, and money probably to get a bunch of marble brought in from somewhere else and turn it into this lighthouse monument memorial for William Livingstone, which makes me think that William Livingstone is somebody really important. So let's find out. Now, I was wrong about part of that. Marble has 
definitely been found in Michigan. But the marble for this lighthouse came from Georgia and formed similarly to how it formed in Vermont. So yeah, a lot of time, money, and effort was put into building this memorial lighthouse. And here's the story. Overall, the way William Livingstone is remembered by history is kind of the opposite of James Scott. Livingstone was born in the 1840s and lived in or near Detroit virtually his entire life, and he ended up playing a huge role in the local shipping industry. The Detroit River is a major shipping lane. Freighters come through this water all the time and can get out to Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, or they can go the other way and access the larger Great Lakes and their associated cities. In the 1860s, William Livingstone started a shipping business with his dad, which began a long and successful career. Along the way, he bought a newspaper, became president of a bank, and notably was also the president of the Lake Carriers Association from 1902 to when he died in 1925. That's an organization that promotes the interests of vessels carrying the U.S. flag on the Great Lakes. While Livingstone was president, he championed various navigational improvements in this area. For one, he had a deeper channel cut in the Detroit River so that freighters could navigate more easily. If you're curious, building that channel involved blasting a lot of limestone with dynamite, among other things. R.I.P. Compressed Sea Creatures. By which I really mean, rest in pieces at this point. Livingstone also helped persuade the U.S. government to build two new locks in the Sioux, in the Upper Peninsula. The Sioux locks helped ships get from Lake Superior into the Lower Great Lakes. And Livingstone was behind various other channel improvements as well. So, unlike James Scott, William Livingstone was a guy who was very fondly remembered for his contributions to Detroit and to the Great Lakes. He supported and improved an industry that supplied countless local jobs. And when he died in 1925, the Lake Carriers Association and just various people in Detroit wanted to build a memorial to him. And a lighthouse seemed fitting. The lighthouse was designed by Albert Kahn, who'd actually built Livingstone's house years prior. If you're into lighthouses, you might notice that there's nowhere for a lighthouse keeper to live here, and that's because the structure was built when lights were becoming automated, so the intent was always for this to be automatic. Today, the Memorial Lighthouse keeps watch over the Detroit River, and at the dedication ceremony for this tower in 1930, the Deputy Commissioner of Lighthouses had this to say about the man who inspired it. The lighthouse has always seemed to me to be symbolic of two primary ideals, reliability and service, and that this permanent memorial has appropriately taken this shape well signifies the extent to which the life of Mr. Livingstone fulfilled these ideals. I'm kind of curious how the south or southwest side of the island got to be a bit more developed with just more going on and Oh man, that's so sweet. Uh, so it says, loving memory of Dean Osgood, 1924 to 1995, Belle Isle, Belle Isle Runners. Man, that's, that's why I love doing stuff like this. There are, are so many stories, so many generations of people who have enjoyed this space and made memories and made friends and community, and I'm grateful to get to be a tourist here, honestly, even if it's just, just for a little bit. I started this series because I really like understanding the world around me. It helps me feel more connected to a place and recognize that I'm just one moment in a larger story. It's been a while since I made a video purely inspired by me visiting a new place for the first time, and I'm grateful to be able to learn things like this. I'm also very excited to learn more about Detroit in the future. For now though, thanks for joining me for a couple of stories. I hope you learned something that makes you think about the world just a little differently, and I'll see you soon.